uh, go to this link and uh, submit them. We're not going to be able to go through all of them. We're, we're going to bounce around just because of time. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, and if you also would like to look at the questions that we are submitting, uh, not submitting, that we're getting ready to discuss, you can go to this link and you can see um, where we're coming from. So question number one from Anonymous at 1212. <laughs> what should we do to leave people who constantly bring us down? What is the best way to show love to those believers? You forgive them. <laughs> Next question. Um, no, I actually look this one up. Yes. Um, I was still. Can y'all hear me? Okay. I was actually still in the process of looking this answer up, but. If you can turn to Galatians 2, 2 and 20, I believe. So it's says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So if you just think about that part alone, you are supposed to approach everything with the, the mindset of Christ. And that does come with those characteristics I went over, being patient, being forgiving, um, loving that person. And then if you continue to read, it says in a life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. So do you have faith in that situation to, I can't remember the full question. Yeah, do, do, in that situation, do you have faith that, and it, I think it says, show love to those who are believers, which means that they have already, they have the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ in them. They might not be walking out their faith. So you have to exhibit that same love and show that this is already in you. Then from there, hopefully, there can be some reconciliation. Ooh. All right, on to the next, uh, next, next question. Um, this is uh, for vocation. How do you know if it's you or the job that needs a change? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I was messing with y'all. So. That's the thing. Sometimes with uh, different jobs, vocation, you do need to be patient. You do need to remain on the job. Uh, sometimes it's, it's more about the impact you have on people there, uh, coworkers there. But sometimes uh, it may need, it may be time for a change. So there's nothing wrong with um, looking elsewhere, applying to other places. But I also say this: um, if you think leaving your job because they have problems, they have issues, they have annoyances. If you think leaving your job and going to another one will fix it, somebody's like, yeah, you're shaking your head. He's like, nah, because they have, they probably more than likely have those same problems there, maybe worse. So if, you, if you're noticing different frustrations on the job, start thinking of, okay, it's chaotic, but God brought order to chaos, so God placed me here to also bring order to chaos as well. So I would say, to the best of your ability, attempt to try to fix those things or put together a plan or have open dialogue with your coworkers or your supervisor, director, to try to fix those things. Now, if they're not interested in fixing those things, not interested in investing in you, not interested in thinking you're valuable or anything of that nature, um, it's okay to look elsewhere, but God will start to open and close doors so you can really see whether or not you need to stay or you need to go. I know it's, it's different case by case, but that's why I say God has you there for a reason. Try to solve those things. If not, it's okay to look elsewhere. But I know for me, when I looked elsewhere, God like opened the door because somebody broke in my car. I had never, my car had never been broken into, but because that happened, I was able to get a job. I'll tell you the story later. But um, things like that start to come to light. I'll tell you a story later. Okay, next question. Um, 
<laughs> it's an interesting story. Um, how can I love my neighbor as myself when I am supposed to be selfless? Doesn't selflessness mean I need to ignore myself? Yes to you. Um, how can I be selfish, selfless and love someone as myself? So yeah, I guess the, it's the dynamic between selflessness. <laughs> Ashley, this one is to you. <laughs> Please turn to <laughs> turn to uh, Philippians two one through five. So the, the selflessness is, let me just read Philippians 2, 1 through 5 first. It says, that in, I'm reading from New American Standards, and I have like, you know, like the little header above, and it says, be like Christ. That's what it's coming from. Um, if there is, if therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. Um, the selflessness comes from. I was like, what? I, was like, I just saw that as a question. The selflessness comes from exhibiting Christ in your relationships with other people. It's not to say that I don't love myself because you are supposed to love yourself as as Christ has shown least love towards us. But that's the kind of selflessness that you're supposed to have: love others as Christ. So when you when you look into those relationships, it's not necessarily saying. I'm awesome. I mean, which I am. I mean, guess you are too. But it is <laughs> it's to say that you have to show humility and be humble when you are interacting with those people. And then the second part of the question, yeah, even in your own, like, love someone as myself, you are not Jesus. You're supposed to have the heart of Jesus, but you are not him. So it's like when you say love someone as yourself, it is pretty much saying, Everything I do, I need to make sure I, ref I reflect it back to the cross. I am not greater and bigger than the cross. Be selfless. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Ashley, one more. Whoa. Yes, we're gonna skip. Um, we're gonna skip the respecting of the boss because I believe uh, Nathan talked about that. Um, for sure, for sure. So we're going to go to how do I pick the right friends? Are they saved? It didn't say that. It just says how do I pick because the right Because the friends? first scripture I had was Psalms 119, 63. Um, you are friends to anyone who obeys God, who fears, the, who fears the Lord and obeys his commandments. And you have to be wise. So not everyone is going to be a friend. And when you are picking those friends, um, you need someone who is going to keep you kind of on the path of righteousness. Um, you can't have a friend who is going to a friend, because even if that friend is a believer and fears the Lord, are they walking out his commandments? Um, so you can't have that person in your life that is going to derail you. And if you refer back to those five, I believe, verses that I had, then you will see, like, it literally says, you can't be friends with unbelievers. Um, you have to be wise. You can't be foolish. And when you think about these things, um, actually, since I have my notes here still. Um, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can, a righteous, how can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? So it's like, you can't be friends with everyone. And if that person is bringing you into darkness or is making you question whether or not you need to go hang out with them, 
then most likely you already have your answer. Joaquin? Um, to piggyback on what Ashley is saying, basically, you know, like, you know that whole tent type deal, associates versus friends type deal? Like, don't, you can't just, like, you can have associates, so to speak, but everybody ain't going to be your friend. Let's just, let's just, let's just kind of put that out there. I was going to say something else, but it just slipped my mind. <laughs> but, um, but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, just because you are associated with someone doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be your friend. And just because, uh, you know, you guys also share a common interest, like for instance, like it, let's just say Nate ain't saved. He like he like football. I like football. We got a common interest. Does that mean we friends? So really, you know, kind of like you know that whole deal where I'm saying, hey, flee useful lust and pursue righteousness, love, joy, faith, all those good things. With those, with a pure heart, it's like. You can't do that if they don't have that same pure heart that you have. So, I mean, you can have a, you can have you can have common interests, but they don't necessarily mean that just because you have a common interest with somebody doesn't mean that you know you're a friend. Two, two cents. Two cents. All right. Um, thank you, Joaquin. So back to Joaquin. So we have one. Uh, we're gonna do I think maybe two, three, more questions. This one's a little tough. Um, how do I approach my spouse regarding abstinence? Whoa! All right. Abstinence. Understanding me. Like when I think of abstinence, I'm thinking abstain. Right? So just, just make sure we got that definition together. Um, so, and, and no, so wife meaning marriage. <laughs> right? So just just want to throw that out there. All right. Right, right, right. So, well, so now here, here, here's, here's my deal. First, I will ask the question or whatnot, is your wife abstaining from you or somebody else? So, so, like, like, so, that's, the first, so that's the first question I will ask, you know, because, hey, your wife could be cheating, you know what I'm saying? And now, if your wife is cheating, I would definitely um, – you know, suggest counseling. Uh, I would suggest, you know, going to our elder Royce. I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> kick it off, kick it off to him. Um, so I would definitely, I would definitely delegate. Yeah, seriously, I would delegate that off um, because that is a deeper issue. Um, if your wife is actually cheating, um, I would definitely take that to Elder Royce. And if you would like to see that, hey, put in the anonymous or whatever. Hey, who is Elder Royce? And I'll put his picture, and you can come up here and cross over and actually get in touch with him now. If you are married, abstaining from sex, that's, that's a problem, right? Because, all right, all right I'm going to take out the Genesis 2. <laughs> Genesis 2. Give me one second. In the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, so um, Genesis 2. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start at verse I'm gonna start at verse 21. Now, after verse 21, God had created you know you know this guy. His name is Adam. In in the in the in the Hebrew, Adam means man. You know, just to let you guys know. So God created this man, Adam. Man, man. Well, God created this. God created Adam. All right. So right. So God created Adam. And now, you know, he's in, you know, he's actually in the garden and God is like, hey, it's not good for a man to be alone. OK, so after that, you know, um, Adam named all the birds of the field and, you know, all the beasts of the air. And yeah, I got, I got that right. So now verse 21 says this. Excuse me, verse 20. I'm sorry, verse 20. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam. There was not a suitable, excuse me, there was not a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. He slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man. 
and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man, woman, because she was taken out of a man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and, and were not ashamed. Now, in, now if, I'm not sure if anybody, you know, if you guys were there when I was talking about family dynamics, but in chapter one, it actually talked about how God created male and female and told them to reproduce his image. Now, and then when you go to Malachi three, when you go to Malachi three, you'll see that God created the institution of marriage to do what? To produce godly offspring. So, so when you're talking about abstaining from your husband, that's a problem. So, you know, or, or you know, if a, if a person is abstaining from her husband, that's a problem. Hey, you know, you were literally created to reproduce God's image, meaning that you should be, be fruitful and multiply. So, hey, sex in itself is not a uh, sin that you should abstain from your husband. Um, because also when you go to, I believe, 1 Corinthians uh, 7, it actually talks about, you know, um, I know. I know. <laughs> so so when you go to first Corinthians seven or whatnot, it actually says that, hey, you know, you are not your own body. And the same for the husband. The husband is not his own body, but it's for uh, but it's for, you know, your, your body is for him and his body is for you. And then it says, if you do, if you do separate, only separate for a little while. Because, hey, that, li that gives time for the enemy to come in and, and, do, and do some things. So, so you don't want to abstain from your husband, nor do you want to abstain from your, from your wife. Because that is a time for you guys to come together. And because really, honestly and truthfully, having sex with your wife is really a form of worship. And, and, that's, and that's for real. So, like, honestly, when God tells you to be fruitful and multiply, what you're basically saying is, is that, God, I believe you so much and I believe your word so much is that I'm going to worship you by communing with my wife in a sexual way. In the, mar the, in the marriage bed. Make that known. Marriage bed. You know, not for you singles who ain't married. But in the marriage bed. So, if you guys are in the, if you guys are married, hey, Technically, if you want to get technical, it's a straight sin to abstain from your husband or your wife. So, hey, get with your wife, share the love, do it. Because that's what you're supposed to, because that's what you're supposed to do with your wife. Amen? I have, yeah, just to piggyback. I can't piggyback that at all. But um, <laughs> So just to start a new journey that is related. Um, Joaquin said it, 1 Corinthians 7, around verse 5. It says, if you are going to abstain or abstinence, there's only one reason. Yeah. The only reason is you all are fasting and praying specifically about something, and you're going on pause. You're so, so in other words, it's implying that you're intimate with your spouse already, and this issue is so serious, you're going on pause, and you're even pausing intimacy to pray about it. But then as Joaquin said, after y'all praying, like, we have to go right back, because you can get tempted by other people, some girls at the gym, um, you know, or, or maybe you're watching a show. They got a lead character who just got out of jail and he looking nice. And then you see somebody who looks like him. That's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to come back together so that you focus on your, your wife and then you focus on your husband. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, the only the only exception is you're you're praying. But I think I've only seen one couple to ever do that. I've only seen one couple to say. This is serious. The issue is cancer. We're going to pray. Yeah. I ain't seen no other couple be like, we're taking a break because we pray. I've never seen If you've seen it, great. I'd love to have another example besides the one, but I've only known of one. And um, just lastly, uh, a good reference, um, a good tool that we have easy access to is uh, Sex and the Gospel. Um, so our pastor, Pastor Blake, has uh, talked about that immensely, and he actually has a series um, that is available through the app and available through purchase. And we can actually purchase it here, I believe. Yeah. So it is, it's, it's available. It's there if you want more in-depth um, discussion about it. It's black and white. It's there. And I, it goes over the four purposes of sex. Help me out. Procreation, recreation, protection, consummation. So, uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, go with that and be fruitful and multiply. All right. Amen. So, um, 
Second to last, uh, what should we do to leave people who constantly bring us down? And, ooh, constantly. And what is the best way to show love to those believers? We did that one? She did that one? Oh, sorry. Was that the first one? Y'all, this nap is about to be awesome. Um, okay, then we'll just do one last one. All right, so the last one. As a member of the sandwich generation, what advice do you have for young adults who are taking steps to align themselves financially with God's wisdom while simultaneously supporting family who have habits that oppose that Nathan Alote? We're... No, we're, we're just between the different generations. You have baby boomers, you have Generation X, then you have us, and then there's an up-and-coming generation where they kind of put us all together, um, if you will. But besides that point, with a lot of financial issues, we kind of get the the bad end of the stick, really. Um, but that's a, that's a whole other story. But specifically to answer this question, um, I would recommend uh, Proverbs 22, reading Proverbs 22. See, here's the thing. A lot of family says things as advice or things they've heard, and maybe they mean well, but they, they're not maybe looking at the situation in full. So what I would recommend is, that's why I referenced Proverbs 22, because you have to start showing them that God has already addressed a lot of the financial issues that they deal with. I know one thing Proverbs 22 says is, it talks about the borrower slave to the lender. Are you in debt? Um, okay, if you're in debt, they run you. Uh, Proverbs 22 also talks about how um, if you're, in other words, if you sign up for something and become a guarantor, again, I, I remember when I went to college, it said, you want to be a guarantor? I was like, I don't know what that means. I want money. But the Bible is actually speaking about that situation. It's saying, why would you sign up if you don't have enough money to pay? They'll come and take the, your bed from under you. That's eviction. You ever been evicted before? So I remember one time somebody in my family was going crazy. Ah, I'm getting evicted. Ah, Lord. And I was like, look at this verse. You signed up for a house that you didn't have money for. So you're getting, they're just taking it back. You didn't have money for it in the first place. 12 months ago, someone advised you, you don't have enough money. You need to get an apartment. I don't want to lose the house. You lost it anyway. So just, you have to start having conversations and showing the Bible has already spoken on a lot of these things that they teach in school. Uh, Dave Ramsey does a great job with Financial Peace University, but everything they're talking about is already laid out in the Bible. Um, working hard and preparing for the future. I believe Proverbs 6 talks about that when it's referring to ants. It's like ants do that. You, you can't do better than an ant. An ant says, man, it's about to get cold. I'm going to store up. Insects. People say, Man, I need I need a house in the future. I'll worry about that later. It's like, what? An insect knows to do that. And, and those are little things that are biting you anyway. Um, so again, just start showing them that the Bible has addressed these issues. Proverbs 22 is a great place to start because a lot of a lot of verses in that chapter talk about money. Uh, it even talks about credit there. It says a good name is better than riches and gold, alluding to the fact that it doesn't matter if you have money or because if you have a bad credit score, we ain't going to work with you. That's your reputation. So, see, all these things I'm just throwing out there, this came, this is from the Bible. Uh, another random fact. Um, do do y'all know, like, after seven years, your credit score gets erased? Like, or the, the older inaccuracies, they just take it off after seven years? That's so random. Where does that come from? It comes from Deuteronomy 15. It says the Lord's release is at, on the seventh year, forgive somebody's debt. It just survived in our culture. So that's, it, that's in our culture. Where did that come from? I don't know, but when it's year seven, we happy. Um, <laughs> you know, but again, see, so the Bible has spoken to all these things. You just start showing that, and it's the truth. The truth doesn't change. And if they can't get with the truth, they might have to find out the hard way. But you keep pressing on uh, what God has led you to do. Amen. Right. Well, that's it. Okay. So everybody pick up um, the uh, extra knives and for, no, I'm, so, I'm joking. But um, okay, so yeah, that is the conclusion of our um, Bible and Brunch. Um, just 
uh, one last thing. Again, in regards to the events that we're having in the future, um, we um, have on the table a fall fellowship happening this year. Um, we don't necessarily know exactly what it is going to be uh, yet, but it will not be here. And it, yeah, it will be off campus and it's just a time to just, just chill and have fun and just... Last year we went to Crate and Barrel in City Center, bowling. Bowl and Barrel. Bowl and Barrel, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Bowl and Barrel. <laughs> but that's where we went last year. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> Yeah, man, we like yes. pot, y'all. So, um, okay, so that that'll be happening uh, this year, and then we're just we're gonna we're gonna chill and, and enjoy the holidays, and then uh, January 2018, we have the Conscious Christianity Conference. Yeah, I'm I'm somewhat biased. Um, so uh, I know Joaquin has uh, talked about it. Um, guys, this is gonna be awesome. This will be hosted uh, by us. Um, but it's it's definitely a, a community um, a, cum, a community conference. Um, just a little bit about it. I know you know again Joaquin discussed it, but um, it's we're not promoting a social gospel. We are not promoting black theology. We're not promoting woke theology. That's not what we're doing. That's not biblical. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about the isms that have set up shop in the church and got entirely too comfortable. And so this is the platform for where we're going to... What's up with y'all today, man? Like... <laughs> this, is, this is the platform that, you know, that is going to just, is, is going to take charge. So we have um, uh, a few of our, our seasoned, uh, seasoned speakers who will be with us. Um, we have Jerome Gay. We have Eme coming. We are very excited. Um, so the opportunity will be here for um, for you. For you guys to you know to help definitely help <laughs> with us um with this conference uh so that's january 2018 next that we know for sure for sure that will be happening next year we'll be doing this again the bible and brunch <laughs> so same time next year uh 365 days from now we're going to be doing this again and then we will have we'll be kicking back off with our refuel we took a break from this year uh, for doing our uh, conference, but we were going to definitely do it again uh, at the end of next year. If you've been to it before, you know it's awesome. You know it's ne it's so necessary. It's just time to just chill and just have a moment with Jesus in the woods. That's it. <laughs> That's about it. So, um, so yeah. So that is. Those are our big events that we're definitely doing um, for uh, for 2018. Um, so, since we have the year pretty much ending out. We um, are preparing for next year. So we will have the opportunity, we have opportunities for, um, for all of us to serve. So you, if you are interested in serving, if you're interested in helping, if you, yeah, if you have ideas, if you have concerns um, that, um, you know, that needs to be you know, brought to, to our attention or even to the elders' attention, um, see Carrie over there who's waving the paper. Um, she will be taking down your information um, if you're interested in doing those things. Last but certainly not least, we are getting ready to bounce 